Um, so I'll give brief introductions and then we're gonna play uh, a short video, but there will be a couple of different videos throughout the presentation uh, this afternoon. Um, so I'm Craig DeHutt and this is my uh, oldest brother, Jeremy. Um, I'm the, the co-founder and the COO of a nonprofit organization we made called Appian Media. And after we show the video, I'll kind of explain what that means and what we do. Um, but I, I wanted to start and, and thank you, Earl and, and Doris, and all of you for welcoming us to this. This is our first time, and uh, this has been really neat. The atmosphere has been amazing. You all have rolled with things so well. Thank you for adjusting. Yes. Everyone's been so flexible. Um, so thank you for being so gracious. Yeah, so we're gonna play a short video and uh, then we'll get talking. I think of the thousands and thousands of hours that this team has put in and it's just the beginning. Early on, Craig and I made the decision that we wanted to give away a lot of these series for free. And you know, a lot of people might say, well, that's crazy. Through the power of donations, we've been able to do this and the thousands of hours that this team has put into it. You think about the reason why. Why would you want to be a part of this? And I mean, when you think about what Ampion Media has set out to do, the Bible is so rich. It is worth it. And it's hard on all of us. It's hard on our families. Bless our wives and our kids who let us go mm -hmm. for weeks. And bless the people who trust us with their money. It's because strangers tell us that it saved them from a dark time. The most important thing is making sure that we're faithful to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people are hearing that. And that it's a spiritual benefit to them. It increases their faith in God. It increases their faith in God's Son, in His Word and it's worth it. To God be the glory. So you all have, you all have shared stories about how, how God's been working in your life and how things got started with what you all do. And I think we could all share a story like this where you go into perhaps a meeting or an encounter and you expect a certain thing and then God kind of turns it into something else. So in 2015, my wife and I had recently moved to Indianapolis. Uh, she's here, Karen, and they didn't want us to reference them. I'm not going to make oh. them stand up or raise their hands, but our wives are back there supporting us. Um, but we had moved to Indianapolis for a job that I had, and I found out that there was another Christian who does what I do. So I'm a video producer, and uh, as we do, we met for coffee and just talked shop. His name is Stuart Peck. And Stuart was sharing with me that at the time, he was teaching a high school Bible class at his church. And uh, he's about my age, and, and he said, I just, don't, I just don't get it. The kids come into class, and during the week, they're learning, and I don't have it on me, but they're learning on iPads and iPhones and on YouTube. That's how they learn. But when they come into to Bible class, we tell them to put all those things away, and I'm trying to show them what Israel looks like. I'm trying to show them the Bible lands. And all I have to show them are these, these dusty maps that we got from the resource room back in the building. And the kids I can see are just, I, I lose them before I even get started. And he said, I'm a visual guy. I'm a visual learner. Surely there's something on YouTube for free that I can show them what Israel looks like. And there were. Uh, there are plenty of, of videos where there's an individual who's, who's lecturing and Jerusalem might happen to be behind them somewhere, but it didn't, it didn't help communicate how amazing the place is and how real and alive the place is. And so Stu said, and I'd known him for less than a month, he said, this is going to sound crazy. What would it take to bring a small group of us, video people, a host or two, and travel over to Israel and make it ourselves? Let's stop complaining about it and let's just Let's just do it. And then give it away. And then give it away for free. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yes, Stuart, that is crazy. I mean, that's nuts. How do we do that? How should we do it? And so in 2016, we launched a Kickstarter campaign. It's a crowdfunding mechanism on, online where you can say, we're trying to make this project. Will you help support it? And... Uh, we asked for $40,000, which for any of you who have traveled to Israel before, you know we were not asking for enough. But we asked for $40,000. And over 200 people responded to a group of people who had never been there before, promising a video with no footage to show them that we could do it. 
And over 200 people responded with $65,000 and said, go over there and do that. So that was, that was in, the, in March of 2016. We took our first trip to Israel in July, mm -hmm. June of that year. And we created a series um, called Following the Messiah. And before we get there, I want to talk just briefly about what the word Appian means. And, and for those of you familiar with the Bible lands, perhaps you've heard of, of this. The Appian Way um, is a Roman roadway, was a Roman roadway that, that originated in Rome and spread throughout the nations that they had been conquering. Um, the best of its kind, where they could bring their commerce and their military and connect these nations in a way that had never been done previous. Stu and I believe, and our team believes, that we have an Appian way in the 21st century, and it's the internet, and it's video, and it's media. It's this roadway that's been built. It's already there, and it's been built uh, for different purposes. Some people are using that roadway in, in ungodly ways. Hollywood's using media in, in terrible ways. But the roadway is there, and the tools are there, and so we created Appian Media to make use of that roadway. And it goes back to the verse that you see up there where Jesus, as he's nearing his earthly ministry, nearing the end of his earthly ministry, pulls his apostles together and gives them a commission we're all familiar with. He said, you have a job to do, and it's a big job. I want you to go, not just to Jerusalem, but everywhere. Well, how could they do that? And I can't speak for God, but the wisdom of God seems pretty apparent here. He chose a period of time where almost everyone was speaking a unified language in Greek. And a roadway had been built connecting nations that had never been connected before. And he used miracles and he used unlikely people, and they did. And we're trying to do the same thing in the 21st century. And so we created, we took two years to do it, two trips to Israel. Uh, each trip's about two weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not a vacation. It's not an Israel tour. It's, it's very hard, grueling work, where we visit as many sites as we possibly can, and we create this series. So Following the Messiah is a 10-episode series, uh, about 30 minutes each episode, and it's free to watch online. And it shows you the places that Jesus taught and, and lived and died and rose and uh, we believe it's, it's powerful. Searching for a king, and hopefully everyone got a copy of the, the DVD mm -hmm. and, and the workbook. If you didn't, we've got a few more copies here. Um, uh, tag one of us and we'll get it. <laughs> Searching for a king is about the nation of Israel and about the kingdom of Israel, um, starting with, with King Saul and David and Solomon. We found as we were researching this that apparently academia tries to write that whole period off and say that David wasn't really real. He was more like a, maybe a King Arthur kind of legend, but probably not a real person. And he certainly didn't rule as big or as substantial as the Bible claims. And there's no proof of Solomon and on and on. And so we set out to look at the proof and the evidence. And so this is a five episode series um, where Jeremy and uh, another man on our team, Barry Britnell, who leads tours over to Israel, the two of them walk us through these places. And especially with Searching for a King, they interview archaeologists and, and individuals there who are digging up faith-affirming proofs literally out of the ground every day. We just released a few months ago a children's series basically packaging up the gospel message into a grade school level 13 episode. These are five to six minute videos so that children can see and appreciate that this land is real that it's not a long time ago in a land far away. But we do that. Didn't, many of us did that as kids, right? It's this place that we probably will never see, and we try to make it real to them. And then, um, and I'll, I'll brag on Jeremy, and I'll brag on another member of our team, Justin Dobbs. Um, when COVID hit, some very interesting things happened to our team. We were planning to travel to Turkey and to Greece in May of this year to create a series about... The, the, uh, the letter written to the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. We didn't go. 
We didn't go. <laughs> that seems to go without saying, but we didn't go. We couldn't go. But instead, our team got together and said, what do people need now in this very uncertain time that we can produce without leaving our country? And man, the, these guys put together a series on the Sermon on the Mount. We came up with the idea and released it in seven days, um, which is amazing. And, uh, and, and people have been able to use that, especially during the time where many of us were not allowed to leave our homes. God's been able to reach a lot of people with this, and it's because we give it away. We believe that the gospel should be free and accessible and barriers should be removed. We also um, chose, and it's kind of been the philosophy of Appian Media from the beginning, we want to go to the squares, the public squares where people are already gathering, and scream the gospel message out. And so we don't necessarily want to create new squares. YouTube was already there, so we decided to fill it with the gospel. Podcasts was something that we are seeing exploding in popularity, especially during COVID. And so we started two podcast series. One is myself and, and Stuart, and we talk about how to evangelize with digital media. Because it's, it's a mindset that, that many of us aren't quite familiar with. And there are tools just waiting for us to, to use them. And then we get Barry Britnell and Dan Kingsley. He's actually here with his wife, Paula, as well. He was gracious enough to, to bring some of his artifacts from the Bible lands. If you've got a moment, tag him and, and ask him to, to tell you what he's got over here. It's, he's you're going to spend all your free video. time over here. Yeah. Um, and so Barry and Dan uh, have a podcast called Digging Deeper. And they do exactly that. They, they talk about the history and the geography, the archaeology of the Bible lands, and ground it in the real, because it is. I'm going to pass it off to Jeremy. Um, God has just really blessed us and, and blessed this, this effort in ways, like has already been said, that we could never imagine or anticipate. And, uh, and we're thankful. I mean, just us being here is an is a example of that. I don't know any of you. <laughs> We don't. And, and Earl reached out to me and, and, and saw our stuff online and said, I don't know you, but I appreciate what you're doing. And so we're here. And so God, God is working, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. One of the original conversations that we had as, as we got started, Craig and Stu started, and I was an add-on later. Um, but we had this conversation about, we have this idea, is it something that we should do? And there were conversations about, well, does God want it done? You know, we could have this idea and throw the idea out there, and we think it's something that ought to be done, but what if God doesn't? And so we've had the philosophy that if God wants it done, it's going to get done. You know, if we're doing the fundraising for each project, if God wants that project done, the funding will be there. If he doesn't want it done, it won't be, and that means we do something else. Um, so to, to be where we are four years later and, and see what God has done, that's God. And that's been repeated several times mm -hmm. over the course of this weekend, and he gets the glory for that. Um, so we're brothers, oldest. He used to be the youngest, and then my parents adopted. I have a 14-year-old brother. Changed I'm 41. Everything. It did, yep. Um, so second youngest brother. That's right. When, when Craig and Stu started talking about following the Messiah and who was going to host and co-host, um, they had several names in mind. They had several criteria that they were looking for. One was, what sucker can we get to do this for free? <laughs> Um, he's like, I know a guy. I know a guy. I know yeah. a guy um, who, who has a job that will allow them to travel for two weeks without pay like that. Um, for 20 years, I've been in the ministry, uh, serving local churches as a located evangelist, counselor, Bible teacher. Um, I've done college campus studies, five years in prison ministry, um, volunteering in there. And I'm very grateful for all of those opportunities. And so through the course of that, Craig was aware of my work. And there were several guys that they had kind of try out. Who do we want to do this? And um, I, I must have snuck them a little bit of something, but <laughs> I got to go. Um, and at the, at the time, the only focus was following the Messiah. We're just trying to do a project. And then we sat in the airport going, what are we, what are we gonna do after this? And so many other ideas came out. The, the timing, um, I'll back up for a second. I knew Craig and Stu were having the conversation about this project. They were having it in late 2015. 
we had just moved to Birmingham, Alabama to work with a church that, that had been through some things and they really, they just needed a break. Um, so Anna and I decided that's where God wants us to go. We went down to Birmingham, Alabama. Um, for us, we needed a change of scene because at the end, not the end, but in 2013, um, we lost one of our kids. We're, we're the parents of six children, uh, some biological, some adopted. Two of those children were special needs. And so we really re related to the song about being in that room. I mean, I've had my hand on the chest of two sons who passed. And so in 2013, our first son passed. And then in 2015, our second special needs son, his health was declining. And he was getting ready to go into hospice. And we were exhausted. And there were some generous, generous people that saw that my wife and I needed a break. And so they sent us to Israel. They sent us to Israel on a tour group. And I wasn't leading. I wasn't teaching. I was just a guy in a seat taking it in with my wife with no other responsibilities for two weeks. But I knew Craig and Stu were having this conversation, so I was taking notes for them. And when I came home, I said, you don't, you don't need me to filter all of this. You need to talk to the guy who led my group. His name is Barry Britnell, great guy. Um, and so it got to the point where we had that conversation, and a couple months later, our second son passed. And Craig offered the invitation, do you want to go? And I just didn't. I wasn't convinced about the timing because I had an oldest son who had just lost two brothers. He had just become a believer, and I didn't want to leave him. And the guys all talked about it, and they agreed that he could go. And so we had to come up with the funds to cover his cost, but we put him to work. But one of the reasons that I asked that was, if I can do this, and you say, yes, that he can go, I want to help shore up his faith. And what better way to do that than taking him with us as we create this apologetic material on the land of Israel and the reliability of the Bible. And so Kenan, who's now 17, he's going into his senior year, um, just applied at a, at a Christian college down in Florida for when he graduates, and praise God for that, um, went with us for two years to help create that material. And it's just, it's been a blessing. Um, it's been a blessing personally um, to see how it has affected my family to make those trips and create these resources. But it's not just with us. Up to this point, I think Craig and I were working on these numbers this last week, um, our media has been viewed over half a million times. There are two million plus minutes that have been viewed. You can track how much people are watching, how much of a video, when do they stop. It's been shown in 160 countries. And what was amazing to us when we started tracking those things was seeing that people were watching it in countries that we could not go and publicly preach. It's illegal. But the gospel is being heard because they're getting online and they can watch it on the privacy of their phone or tablet or computer. Right? So God is getting his message out there and we're just very, very grateful for that. Over the, over the last several years, these various platforms have started picking up these resources and making them available to their members. Some of them are subscription-based, some of them are not. Um, what's really exciting is when you start to see logos that are in different languages, because it means that they're putting subtitles and making it more accessible to non-English speakers. And we're so, so grateful um, to see those people do that. There was a gentleman that reached out to me uh, about a year ago, I think it was about a year ago, and he shared this. He's anonymous because he was in Saudi Arabia when he wrote this. Watching y'all's videos has meant so much to us. It's brought new life and understanding to our Bible reading. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You have no idea how much light it has brought to us while living in a country where churches are outlawed. Keep up the wonderful work you and your team do. The, the world needs more. The world needs more people who are willing to step up and find ways to reach out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we're super grateful for what God is doing there. So the first project we started with was Following the Messiah. I want to talk just a minute about searching for a king. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and play mm -hmm. the, the trailer that we put together for that and talk about the, the philosophy behind it. If I read the scriptures well, there are so many things there which seem to be a reality. There are stories and people in the Bible that are easy to take for granted. Powerful kings, battles with giants, amazing faith, even overwhelming failure. 
The question is, do these narratives describe real events? Or are they simply legends? What does the physical evidence indicate? Is there evidence for the United Kingdom of Israel? Sometimes we do have questions where we scratch our heads, but in archaeology we say that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We've only excavated about 5% of the land of the Bible. 95% is still underground. Jerusalem, which is one of the most excavated places upon Earth, has a black hole. We're digging through layers of history. Something definite happened right here. Wow. We are way off the beaten path now. Way, way off the beaten path. God's people demanded a king. God selected three men. An insecure man of great stature, a shepherd who slew a giant, and the wisest man to ever live. We are searching history, geography, archaeology and scripture to find the answers. How would you respond to critics? Can the Bible be trusted? Jerusalem itself leads in the fact that there is unequivocal proof that there is a connection to the Bible. Everything that they found dates exactly to the time of King David. So we're not talking about fairy tales, we're talking about real people, real places, and real events. Come with us as we search for a king. And we had audio problems there. <laughs> so what we ran into, what so, we talked about. Sometimes there are potholes on the Appian Way. Oh, that's right. right. <laughs> As we sat in the conference room talking about what do we do after two years of the life of Jesus? Where do we go in our Bibles? We talked about how we had spent so much time in the New Testament focusing on the most important part, which is the life of Jesus. But what about the Old Testament? And so in our, in our personal experiences, especially on college campuses or in evangelistic studies, the the Old Testament is a big black hole for people, um, especially when you start getting into the major and the minor prophets. But when it comes to the historical figures of Saul, David, and Solomon, there, there was a push among academics, especially in the, the 80s and the late 80s, to say that that was a myth. And so when you t talk about archaeology in Israel, the vast majority, at least more than 90% of the people that are digging in Israel are not believers. They're not believers. They don't believe in the, the literal word of God. So when they're going and looking through, they're actually trying to disprove that there was an ancient Israel. And so as we talked about all of those factors, we said, well, what if we do a docu-series on whether our text is reliable and whether the Bible really talks about an ancient Israel? Was there a Saul, David, and a Solomon? Let's go and do that. And we were really blessed to interview some fantastic people. Um, Dr. Gabriel Barkai has been there for decades um, he's recognized internationally as an expert in his field. Uh, several others, Dr. Scott Stripling, who's one of the, the few Bible believers who's leading expeditions. He's the lead archaeologist at Shiloh. Um, he would say Shiloh. That's right. Um, so we were able to interview those people, and that's what that project was all about. So that's what we gave you. What we gave you was the entire docu-series. Um, you can download it if you want from our website, but there's also the study guide. And just a little plug about the study guides. Um, what we started doing, we actually reformatted our study guides in the last 12 months. Um, these are brand new printed books. We've never printed books before. They were digital downloads until recently. But we wanted to, to help people not binge watch our stuff. We're, we're not into creating content to entertain people. We're, we're creating content to challenge people and help them come to faith. And to do that, they need to encounter God through his word. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to create tools to get people into the Word and interacting with the Spirit of God. And so what we did is at the beginning of each lesson in our new study guides is a QR code where you can zoom in with your device, watch the video, but then use the study guide to go deeper into your Bible and ask more personal questions and, and test the text. And it's been really exciting to see people use those. I use them with my kids. Um, so... We had following the Messiah, searching for a king, and then we came back to the drawing table and we're like, doing this once a year is exhausting. <laughs> we need to have a longer term vision. Like, what are all the projects we're trying to do for the next five, for the next 10? And so what we did is we sat down in 2019, the spring of 2019, and it was a pitch party. We all came 
to pitch different ideas about what content are we going to create next. And one of the ones that really stood out was our projects up to this point, following the Messiah and searching for a king, have, have they've done the job of trying to demonstrate the reliability of the biblical text. They're apologetic in nature. The text is reliable. Jesus was a real person. He really did live in Israel. He was a carpenter's son. He existed. He was crucified. He rose. And then you get to searching for a king. Saul, David, and Solomon were real people. Their kingdoms were real places. You can go and see where they were. But something started going on in 2019. Um, a couple of things. Hostility toward Christians was increasing and became more obvious in media. So if you remember in 2019, uh, especially around Easter time, there were the bombings in Sri Lanka at churches where between 200 and 300 people were killed. And that was not an isolated incident. And then on top of things like that, I was, I was having conversations with my oldest son who was going into his junior year of high school, and someone had recommended this to me, and I sat him down and I said, you've got two years left at home, and our church is great, I'm grateful for what our church family does, but it's my job as your dad to make sure that you've been exposed to as much of God and his word as possible. Where are your gaps? As we look at the Bible, where do you think your gaps are? And guess what he said? Major, minor prophets and revelation. And I said, well, let's kill two birds with one stone. You and I are going to start studying Daniel to get ready to study revelation. Yeah. Right? And so that's what we did. He and I started meeting every week in a coffee shop. He started bringing his friends. And by the time we were done, we had 12 people crowding out of Starbucks studying through Daniel and revelation. And so we pitched the idea to the guys and they said, that's great. How are we going to do that? Like, where do we go to shoot all the beasts? Where do we go to? <laughs> and so this is what we decided to do. Yeah. What we decided to do was to help establish that the biblical text is not just reliable, but it's relevant. It's relevant. Because God and his son Jesus, through the Spirit, sent a vision to John to help John and those first century saints with something. We benefit from the message, but they needed to hear something. And we need to hear the same things. The same thing with Daniel. Daniel needed to hear things, but we need to hear the same things. And so we decided to do a, an introduction to Revelation. And there's this fantastic quote I came across by David Pallison. I'm not sure how many of you have read his works. I really love his stuff. He said this, In the economy of God's instruction, things that he said and did with desert shepherds in the ancient Middle East proved directly instructive and encouraging to urban Greco-Romans one or 2,000 years later. You remember Romans 15.4? The things that were written before times were written for our instruction. And they prove the same for us today, yet another couple thousand years along. Wildly different circumstances are not fatal to significance and relevance. I love that. I am not a desert shepherd. I'm a kid who grew up on the West Coast in Oregon, liberal Oregon with a bunch of tree huggers, okay? But what they needed to hear is what I need to hear. He went on to say, there is no temptation that is not common to all, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And that common to all spans centuries and millennia, not just people groups or gender. Yet no situations or persons are identical. The merciful father comforted Paul in his troubles, making him able to comfort those facing any trouble, 2 Corinthians 1 including you and your troubles, so that you can help those in any trouble. This dynamic of the living and omni-adaptable word creates one of the many joys of the Christian faith. It also makes you game to tackle any problem, however unfamiliar, dark, and contorted. Amen? Amen. That's powerful. And so the next video project, as an introduction to Revelation, we want to look at what, what was it that Jesus wanted to imprint on John about himself? Because as you start going through the first three chapters, there's something that Jesus really wanted to engrave on their hearts early on as he continued to address what they were about to face and what Christians down the road in history would face. So for example, let's go ahead and play the trailer, and then I'm going to get a little uh, preacher-like on you. Right. Temptation. Power struggles. Compromise, persecution. These obstacles to faith can feel isolating and unique, but disciples of Jesus have been facing these hurdles since the beginning. How were early Christians able to endure 
even triumph over them. My name is Jeremy DeHutt. Join me as I explore seven special cities where a group of first century churches received a deeply personal letter written by an exiled apostle who was given an awe-inspiring vision from Jesus himself. Let's discover what timeless principles this powerful letter holds for believers everywhere. Okay, time to open some Bibles. All right, I know I've referenced several things and paraphrased a couple of things. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to put them up on the, on the screen. So if you want to make a note and look at them later, you can. But the title that we've given this next project is Trial and Triumph, because that is the theme of Revelation. You have these first century saints that are about to undergo increasing amounts of persecution, things that would drive them away from their faith if they let it. And we face similar things today. You have these trials. But the way that Jesus presents himself in the overarching theme is that we serve a victorious Savior. Ultimately, he has already won, and we're just waiting to benefit when everything's all wrapped up. And so we want to acknowledge the trial, but the biggest picture is I need a vision of my triumphant Savior. And when you think about that, you can summarize it. In moments of distress and adversity, God's people need a sharper, clearer, fuller vision of him. Think about some biblical examples, and I'll rattle them off for you. Do you remember Job? What was Job's conclusion about God in chapter 42 after that whole trial was said and done? We're going through this with our, our kids during our family devos right now. We're almost there. I can't wait because I'm tired of listening to his friends. <laughs> what did Job say in chapter 42? My ear has heard of you, but now my eye sees you. My perspective of who you are, God, after being rebuked for the last couple of chapters and humbled from the last couple of chapters, I still don't know everything that's going on, but I know you better. I see you better. Job needed to see God better. Or what about over in 1 Kings chapter 19? 1 Kings chapter 19, you have Elijah who is just beat down and tired and discouraged. And God sends him out for an encounter and God shakes him and rattles him and makes loud noise, and you see fire, and then there's this calm, calm, quiet voice. And he compassionately interacts with his prophet, who needs a better vision of God. And he needs God's vision of what's going on. There are people here who still believe in me that you don't see yet, but I see them. Trust me that I see them. Elijah needed a better vision of God. Or what about, what about Ezekiel chapter 1? Ezekiel's vision of the wheel within the wheel, God's incredible chariot that comes rolling in while he's in captivity with the rest of the Israelites. And the message and the job that he's about to be given is one that no preacher wants. I want you to go preach to a bunch of people who think they're going to be okay in a couple of days and tell them they've got 70 years to go. And I want you to go tell them knowing that they're not going to listen. Go. Along the way, your wife's going to die and I'm not going to let you grieve her. What do you think a man like that needs in order to be able to do the job well? He needs Ezekiel 1. He needs an awe-inspiring vision of the God who's not simply looking at Jerusalem. He's the God of everything and everywhere, and he shows up in captivity to help Ezekiel drop to his knees. Ezekiel needed a clearer vision of God before he started his ministry. Several times in the book of Daniel, several times in the book of Daniel, you have, you have God give a vision of himself to Daniel. It's actually language from Daniel that's borrowed and used by John in the Revelation. So much of that, especially in, in Revelation chapter 1, Daniel needed a clearer vision of God, and not just of God, he actually had a vision of Jesus in John chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 7. Right? Think about the first century Christians. Let's bring it a little bit closer to the context, the historical context of Revelation. What did, what did God bless Stephen with in Acts chapter 7 as he was being martyred for his faith? A vision of Christ. A vision of Christ standing up beside the throne of God. And after he receives that vision, he's, he's encouraged to hang on and endure. And twice before he dies, he calls out to Jesus as my Lord my Lord, and in one of those instances, actually prays for the forgiveness of the ones killing him. 
because of his vision of Christ, right? And then what about over in Hebrews chapter 12? As Paul is encouraging those saints who are discouraged and thinking about walking away from Christianity, do you remember what he says in the first couple of verses of chapter 12? He, he reminds them that they're not alone. There's a great cloud of witnesses watching you run this race. But then he talks about fixing your eyes on Jesus. You keep your gaze locked on him, and that will help you endure by faith, whatever it is you're going through. Fix your gaze on Jesus. I like that phrase, fix. The NIV uses the word fix. I think the, the ESV version softens it a little bit when it says looking to Jesus. I like that idea of like it's nailed right there. My gaze is fixed on Christ. So that's, Lord willing, that's the goal. We have been planning and waiting and waiting for an opening and countries that will let us come in without 14 days of quarantining. Um, we were supposed to go in May, and then we were supposed to go in September, and now we're trying to get there before the end of the year. Who knows what God's timing is? If God wants it done, it'll get done. Yeah, so we need your prayers for sure. Please. Um, d d from the very beginning, it's always been, if this is what he wants... And we yep. usually say that in regards to the funding, yes. but if this is what he wants, he'll, he'll make it happen. Right now we're saying that in regards to the, the countries being willing to, to let us come in. Absolutely. And uh, it's needed. I, I, I hope Jeremy just, uh, I'm excited about this. Jeremy's working on the outline of the video that I see in my head that he sees in his, but I hope you guys are excited about this. Uh, we just need to get over there and do it. And so- The point prayers. is it's relevant. We need yep. this. We need this. Yep. We need a greater vision of Jesus. And so do the rest of our churches. Mm -hmm. And primarily, Revelation is written to believers. What happens in Revelation is meant to help drive repentance among non-believers. And we certainly hope that that happens. But believers can grow weary. And believers can let their gaze drift from Christ. And so as we thought about last year in Sri Lanka, we thought about my son and him heading off to college. I want his eyes nailed on Jesus. That's where I want his gaze fixed. Yeah. And we're hoping to produce this and help people think about that as they continue to study through Revelation. This is just the introduction. Yep. So thank you for that, for that time. I'll turn it back to you. Uh, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity. Uh, we're so encouraged um, by what you all are doing. And Amen. we hope that, that what we've provided to you is encouraging. And there's, there's hours more. There's hours more online that you can watch and read and study. That's and, right. Uh, yep. Um, I don't know if time permitting, uh, I know we're up, <laughs> um, typically we open it up for questions and that normally usually involves the question of, is it safe to travel to Israel? And I'll answer that right off the back and say, yes, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, who, I'm sorry, 31 trips, was that? Yeah. <laughs> 31 trips. So, yes, it's Yes, safe. it is. It is safe. Um, um, but if you'll permit us a, a few minutes, we'd be willing to maybe answer a, a handful of questions. That's I love that. I love that. This always happens. This always does. No one wants no to No one wants out. to ask a question, and that's okay. It's all, it always takes one person. Yeah. And if we don't get it, we're not going to burn time because... Lunch is waiting. I Lunch think. is waiting. Lunch is waiting. Yeah, someone's eyeballing me like I'm in the way. And by all means, through, through the oh. free time... Um, wait, I'm the, sorry? He's waving. Like, he's waving. There, there he is. I'm going to be teaching kindergarten through sixth grade Bible. Good to use these videos for that. I think Lessons from the land. Um, that would be the most geared toward that age group. Um, so the study guides that are written, especially following the Messiah, it's more of a uh, high school age, college age, adult level book. But we've had people take them and simplify all of it. So yeah. think of it as a teacher's guide that you can make use however you want. And the, the videos themselves, I, I mean, uh, Karen can tell you, I test them on my own family. I have three children at home, uh, six, four, and two, and they'll watch all the videos all the way through. Yeah. And uh, they will, the two-year-old sometimes has a little time. <laughs> but my six-year-old loves the story of the, the Good Samaritan because now he can see where that would have occurred. And, uh, and he loves the story of David and Goliath because we take Searching you to the Searching for a king, Elah, going to the Valley of Elah. Yeah. Um, the study guides obviously are, are, are for a higher age group, um, but the videos themselves... Show it to them. Yeah, one of, the one of the benefits of the study guides is we've already broken the videos down into smaller segments. So we encourage you to watch, you know, from this mark to this mark, and then these are the biblical texts you can use to talk about it um, instead of just watching whole episodes in a class. Very good. Yes?
yet. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, as far as linking the YouTube videos or even we have the videos themselves on Facebook, Our Facebook you channel. could just share those as well. That, absolutely. We, we would encourage that. This microphone, I'm going to break it before we're over. So if you have any questions about the best way to do that, um, those are, yep. email Craig that question. <laughs> that question. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> Anybody else? I want to make sure I don't miss any other waves. All right. All right, thank you all so much, Butch. Thank, thank you, you for, thank for you giving us the opportunity. Me.